It's interesting how sometimes, every now and again, people will take a single quote from the scripture or from poetry or anything, really, and exacerbate it or quote it out of context. I remember 20 years ago, as we are still remembering the 20 years after 9-11, when the President of the United States was addressing a joint session of Congress, from that speech he addressed nations that might harbor terrorists against the U.S. and other countries, and he said, you are either for us or you are with the terrorists. Whereupon immediately in the aftermath, some of his critics said, He's saying the same thing that Anakin Skywalker said in the third Star Wars movie as he was falling over to the dark side. Now granted, Anakin Skywalker did say to his once good friend Obi-Wan Kenobi, you are either with me or you are my enemy. To which Obi-Wan says, only a Sith speaks in absolutes. But in all fairness, Jesus said the exact same thing. In the Gospel of Matthew, he says, those who are not for me are against me. But the context in which he said that was blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. One can't say they are for Christ and at the same time blaspheme the very spirit that drives him and is the bond of love between he and his father. In today's Gospel, Jesus says the exact opposite when he says, whoever is not against us is for us. And what's the context in which he says it? Because he's not contradicting himself, obviously. But here the context is in someone else who is not of his immediate company speaking and teaching in his name. And when it is brought to his attention, his answer is basically, well, what's wrong with that? No one can speak well of him and speak in his name and at the same time speak ill of him. And no doubt that was an issue in the early church where there are people who had come to believe in Christ but were not entirely tied to the uh, central body of the apostles and the church. Jesus isn't necessarily condoning it, but he's not condemning it either because would that everybody preach the gospel? And it's something for us to remember at a time, especially over the last 500 years of Christianity, our faith has been fractured between Catholics and non-Catholics and even Protestant groups that have broken up over the last few hundred years. Some have returned to the Catholic Church, not the least of which are the, some Anglican and Episcopalian Catholics who have formed a group under a Catholic leadership in union with the Holy Father. We see that with many of the Eastern Rite Catholics who have left the Orthodox Church to return to union with the Catholic Church and continue to enrich our liturgical tradition with their Eastern rites of celebrating the Mass. And we work hard to bring about a renewed unity of all Christians. But at the same time, we remember what Christ said, that they may not be of our company, but they are not necessarily against the Christian message. Now, we know that there are some denominations that will say that of other denominations. There are some who say that about the Catholic Church. The, you know, the Catholic Church is the great whore of Babylon and things like that because we are not of a certain company of Christians. But Jesus reminds us of a different perspective and really gives us a new angle to see things, especially a person of a Christian faith who is not of our company. Now, of course, we all know the lessons on perspective and the lessons of what our outlook is. We're all familiar with the image of the glass that is half full of water or liquid. And there are those who say the glass is half full. And then there are those who say the glass is half empty. I would take it a step further because I've met people who would see the same glass and say that the glass is all empty. They'd ignore the water that's there because their outlook is so negative. Jesus here is giving us a different outlook when it comes to people who are not necessarily of our company, but still profess a faith in Christ, which is something the early church no doubt had to grapple with, which is why Mark remembers it in his gospel, and something, of course, we deal with even to today. In the first reading, we see the same dynamic. 
in which we have the two men, Eldad and Medad. And if I can do a bit of a side here, I've always been amused by some of the names that are picked in scenarios like this, Eldad and Medad. It makes me wonder if they're related. Uh, I remember a TV show in the 80s, some of you might remember it, called Charles in Charge with Scott Bale and Willie Ames. And Charles' best friend is a man named Buddy. His proper name is Buttons. Did I mention this was a comedy? And he has a sister named Bunny, whose proper name was Bunnins. And Charles at one point is asking, what kind of parents name their kids Buttons and Bunnins? To which Buddy says, well, maybe my parents, Clarence and Florence. I remember in a parish, and this is a true story, in a parish I had previously about 11, 12 years ago, a wonderful family in the parish, very polite, two sons, very polite, brought up very well. They're now young men. And their names were Ethan and Gavin. And remembering this TV show, I asked them, I said, well, what kind of parents named their kids Ethan and Gavin? And they said, our parents, Louie and Lori. Well, here we have Eldad and Medad, who receive the same spirit of prophecy but separate from the company who came and formally received it from Moses and from the presence of God in the tabernacle. Joshua wants to silence them, but Moses has a more positive outlook. Joshua and others would say they're not of our company. Moses would say, but they're still preaching God's word, having received that prophetic voice. And would that all of us be prophets who can speak that word of God. Is that not the goal of salvation history? Is that not the goal of Christ's work on earth and the continuing work of sanctification of the world? But it's all a matter of outlook, an us versus them mentality, even among people who share a basic faith in Christ, an us versus them mentality, even among those who are in the company of the people of Israel and have now received the gift of prophecy. Or do we work as a unified and work more toward a greater unified community of faith, professing that faith in the gospel? In one context, Jesus gives us the opposite sentiment when it comes to blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, thereby undermining the work of the Spirit. Here, it's a question of bringing people together in the one faith, and we have a history in this church of the ecumenical movement in which we work together with other Christian faiths to talk about our common faith and our common goals in evangelizing that faith while still working toward a greater unification and hopefully a final union of all Christians throughout the world. But for the time being, we don't undermine the common message that we have in proclaiming the faith in Christ because, as Jesus says, those who are not against us are for us when they also proclaim the faith in Christ, preach in the name of Christ, work in the name of Christ. And Jesus asks us to have that more positive approach to fellow followers, even as we work to bring all followers together into one fold and one church who profess one faith. So as we come to receive this Eucharist, which is rightly called our communion, our act of unity with Christ, let us also be given that grace to recognize and appreciate others outside our company of the church who profess a Catholic faith, always praying that Christians throughout the world may one day be united under one church, under one fold, under one shepherd proclaiming one faith. But also, let us keep in mind the perspective that Christ gives us today and not be so fixated on what divides us that it undermines the message and the mission we are called to give and ultimately pray that as people of one faith, we will one day be gathered under one church, under one shepherd.